Thank you, Father God, for this awesome opportunity to stand behind this holy desk once again to minister your word. Allow me to step back as you step forward. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, and may your word go forth, great seed in good soil. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Uh, absolutely, I adore that song. When I start, heard it queued up, I got extra excited. So it's one of my favorites. It's just like a special treat, right? Especially right before you minister, you hear something that just so moves your heart and your soul. And there's nothing like a, a song of worship that reminds us how much we love the Lord. When I think on the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my heart cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. See, if he did nothing else, he saved me. And that is more than enough, amen? But the goodness of the Lord is not only did he save me and save us fellow believers, he remains with us steadily. No matter where we go in life, no matter what comes into our lives, the Lord is there. Oh, hallelujah. We are described as his sheep. And uh, we've been studying in Sunday school about the sheep and uh, the relationship between the Lord and we as sheep of his pasture, right? And the characteristics of, of these animals, these precious, precious animals, and most certainly the characteristic of the good shepherd, which is the Lord. Now, we're told that sheep are not the sharpest tools in the shed, not the sharpest animals, but it doesn't mean they're not intelligent. And, and when we say they're not the sharpest, it's just how they function, right? How they relate to the world around them, all right? Um, you don't train a sheep, right? You got to work with them. <laughs> uh, when we talk about uh, a shepherd doesn't drive his sheep, right? He must lead his sheep right? Uh, sheep are inherently fearful creatures, right? If they're startled, they can have a heart attack and just drop dead, right? So the shepherd of the sheep has to be very mindful, very caring, and very loving as he takes care of his precious little sheep. And we, as children of God, are those precious little sheep. And we are given to fearfulness, we are given to much anxiety in life, right? A situation comes up, and sometimes the most seasoned saint doesn't know what to do. Feels shaken down to the soles of their feet. What, what am I going to do, Lord, right? First question, what now? But having a shepherd that leads means he was already ahead of us. See, he saw what was coming and prepared the way. He says, I, I know you're anxious. I know you can be fearful, but perfect love casteth out all fear. And that's what I, I love so much about the, the shepherd that leads the sheep. See, he's looking for danger. He's looking for pitfalls that his sheep can, can injure themselves in, right? He is mindful of the terrain, and he is mindful of predators. And because these sheep know the voice of their shepherd when he calls, they come to him. Right? So he prepares the way, and he leads them, and here they follow. Uh, we're told in John chapter 10, uh, you know, the sheep know my voice. When I call, they will follow me, and as strangers, they will not follow. And actually, I, I have a little video that I'm going to show. So I want to check, are we good? Oh, uh, yeah. So we're going to just an example, just to show what it is like for these sheep, right? And their shepherd. And then we're going to continue on in the message. If I was going to have a title for the message, it would be, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. Because see, these shepherds have to develop a relationship with their sheep. Uh, for them in order to trust them, right? Uh, to follow after them. Amen. And so... 
believe in them. And as I said, sheep are very fearful, scared animals. We say scaredy cats. I don't think it should be a scaredy cat, a little scaredy sheep. And we oftentimes, like these scaredy sheep, we can get off the path. But thank God for our shepherd, who even if he loses one, right, if we said the 99, right, they all stick together, if that one wanders off, that shepherd goes and gets that one. And if a sheep, an interesting fact, if a sheep is prone to injure themselves often because he wanders away a little too much, the shepherd will actually hobble the sheep. He will break one of its legs, but then he will bind it, and then he will carry the sheep as the sheep is healing. Because see, the wandering is dangerous, amen? And sometimes in our lives, we experience that hobbling because God needs to carry us, Christ needs to carry us, so we stop wandering away. Okay, I see this is loaded up. Do sheep only listen to their shepherd? Amen. Let's see what happens. No, it's a stuck. Okay, can we get volume? Okay, so we can't really hear. This individual's trying to call the sheep, right? Oh, maybe we'll try again. Right, and they're told, okay, go out there. Got to get the sheep to you. Right, sheep ain't paying that lady no mind. Right? They're just standing out there grazing. They hear her. It's not that the sheep don't hear her. They do. Oh, she just got to give up. All right, maybe another person. Maybe she's got a friendlier voice. All right, maybe the sheep will listen to this one. Hey, she, she's real skinny. Nope, another failure. The farmer. If you notice, the sheep instantly, you see them lifting their heads? Uh-oh. Who's that? <laughs> right? Oh. It's not them other people. Wait, wait. I think he's calling us. Uh-oh. Yeah. Wow. Far and wide. Far and wide. Yeah, ladies, they're kind of taking their time. And there we go. Thank you. That was phenomenal. So you see, right? Amen. <laughs> We, we, yeah, so there was a couple stragglers in the background, like, I'm going to let you run for him. I'm going to walk over to him, set him up there. there there's a reason that uh, Christ is very specific when he talks about shepherding and hearing the voice. As we saw uh, the sheep as they're grazing, right? Their heads are down while they're grazing. Um, actually, sheep have very poor vision. We see, right, our eyes are at the front of our head. We see straight forward. Sheep, their eyes are on the sides of their heads. And interestingly enough, when their heads are down, they actually have a good periphery vision, but they can't see directly behind them, right? And they can even miss some things straight out front. But their hearing is very acute. You know, when one sense is a little lacking, usually our others pick up. So that is the thing. The sheep may not know their shepherd by sight, but they will know him by voice. And we see when he was calling them over, he said, all right, y'all, come on. They all, they came, most of them came running, a couple came trotting, but they came running down. And not only does, do the sheep know the voice of the shepherd, the sheep know their name. Interesting fact, shepherds also name their sheep, right? Call them out individually. Okay, brown leg, come here. Come here, little brown leg. <laughs> Spotted one, come here, little spotty, you know? Uh, but in relation to ourselves, and as we, we, we think of Christ, who uses the analogy of being a good shepherd, and we, his sheep, he knows us individually. He knows us intimately. As the Father knows the Son, the Son knows us. The Father and the Son are intertwined. 
And although they serve separate functions, they've always been together. And they have that deep inner working knowledge of one another. And that same deep interworking knowledge is the knowledge that Christ has for us. Amen? Knows exactly what we need. Knows exactly when we need it. For us, in the relationship, we are responsible to responding to his voice. And when we respond to his voice, it is because of relationship, not because of religion. Huh. See, we can get caught up in tradition. We can get caught up in what we should do for custom. But the thing that Christ is most concerned with is our intimate relationship with him. What do we do when he calls us? What, how do we respond? Do we come running to him or do we run away? Do we trust in this good shepherd that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I have gone before you. I know what's coming and I will lead you through all of the valleys to take you to the mountaintop. I am with you. But do we trust him? What happens when we're introduced to Christ? and then called on to respond about our relationship with him. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 9. Our Sunday school lesson this morning was on John 10. I'm going to go a little back. And I recommend Sunday school. You don't come, you should come. It's phenomenal. Put a plug in. It is phenomenal. From the babies on up, it is phenomenal. We get some good food, some good food in this house. So John chapter 9 we're introduced to a blind man. And it reads, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because mm. see, that was, if there was an ailment in these times, it was believed it's because of sin. Well, and we kind of think a little bit of the same nowadays. If something is befalls us, well, what did you do? What, what, what have you been up to to have all this calamity? And sometimes it has nothing to do with us. Yet it is a part of our lives. It is a lot that has been placed on us to say, look, look I will be with you. I will not let the floodwaters overtake you. It doesn't say I'm, I'm going to not let the floodwaters come but I'm not going to let them overtake you. So that says there's going to be flood in life, amen? The fire will not consume you. Doesn't mean there won't be fire. I just won't let it consume you. So the disciples here were still with their, you know, misunderstanding of how ailments work, amen, and, and tribulation in life work. They said, well, who did it? Was it him or was it his parents? Because see, to be born blind from birth, that meant either he sinned in the womb or his parents committed a sin before he was born. That was their thinking. Now Jesus replied, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work with the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am a light of the world. Mm. He said that there was no sin it, he didn't do something in the womb before he was born that made him blind. I said, this man was blind so that my father's work could be seen. So the power of God could be seen on this earth. See, trial and tribulation for us saints, us believers, is to show the glory and honor of God. See, how you're going through it counts, right? How you're facing it matters. It's not something to blame God for, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. It's for us to turn to the great I am and say, Lord, whether or not you deliver me from this, I know that you are the I am and I trust in you. Ha. But he said, no, this was purpose so that I could come across him today in front of you and everybody else and perform the works of God. Mm. Nothing to do with him necessarily as far as what he did, right? This is about what God was doing with his life and with the lives of all those that were watching. Verse 6. 
When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made a clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. See, uh, the, the clay, that was an ointment at that time. That's how they, they'd make that, you know, with some saliva and the clay. That was a salve, if you will, right? But there were two parts. This man met Christ as a stranger to know the Lord. He was begging at the gate. The disciples had a conversation about him. He probably wasn't even present right there. He was probably off begging him, you know, just trying to hustle up some money. And his disciples just had a question. He said, now I'm going to show you why this man is blind, so that I may heal him and prove the work of God. But again, it was two-part. It wasn't just for Christ to apply the salve to his eyes. Christ sent him to go wash it off, right? So there was a work involved, not a, a work unto, you know, like he, do you believe? Your faith is in what you do. The faith was in him going to the pool to wash it off because he, he could have just stood there and just, you know, could you put that thing on my eyes, right? He could have just wiped it off. I don't know this man. I can't even see him because he's blind. He can't see. He's just hearing him, right? Amen. But he was a sheep. He could not see, but he could hear. And that voice sent him, hallelujah, to the pool to wash off his eyes. He said, now go and wash it off. And he went and he washed off the clay because it had to be faith. So I'm thinking, somebody, you know, lead me. Lead me to the water. He got to the water. He washed off the clay. He could see. Oh, hallelujah. This man, Jesus, came into this town, a stranger to this blind man, and suddenly he can see. Oh! Verse 4, verse 8, sorry. Therefore the neighbors of those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He looks like him. Can't be him. Now this one, he, he's been blind. He was born blind. That can't be him. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he now? He said, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I know I can see. And I know who did it. Amen. He knew who to give the credit to. They said, how did this happen? So already there was conflict and there was debate. This miracle had occurred. Now, mind you, he grew up in this town with these people for his entire life. And some had the nerve to look at him. Oh, no, that ain't, that ain't Tommy. That just kind of looked like Tommy. Mm -mm. Tommy blind. Tommy been blind. Tommy didn't suddenly get sight. Yeah, no, that can't be him. Kind of look alike him, but that, that's not him. Unbelieving, right? When God sometimes does powerful things in our lives, understand there will be naysayers. There will be those that say, oh, that wasn't God. That, you just worked really, 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 really hard and got that promotion. That had nothing to do with God. You know what you're talking about? What? That's not, I, you keep throwing this word favor around. That's not favor. That's just what you did with your bootstraps. Hallelujah. But we know better, saints. We know that all good and perfect gifts come from above. And we acknowledge God and all that he has done. Right? We don't need the credit. I say it's the Lord. Amen. So, right, so there's already these debates going on. Uh, further down in verse 13, he's brought before the Pharisees because now here's this debate. Okay, you said it was this man, Jesus. Well, we need to know, did you really get healed by him? What's, what's going on? You see, the Pharisee already had great issue with Jesus. And it was interesting because some believed that this man was healed by washing clay from his eyes in Christ, by Christ, and some didn't. So we see in verse 15, then the Pharisees also asked him again, how he had received his sight, and he said to them, I put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. 
Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Ah, a key. This man was healed on a Sabbath day. Ah, we got a case for tradition. Oh, that you, it can't be a man or woman of God doing something on the Lord's day. And that is what the Pharisees stood on. Now they want to, now they're, they're, if we're going to accuse, and we can say he's clearly not sent of God. Because on the Sabbath, we're just supposed to rest. But he's working, and he healed you. Missing the point that he healed a man. So focused on tradition, so focused on religion, missing relationship. That you see me hurting you see me wounded. You see me in need. But you're so focused on everything else that you will overlook my need. Come on, huh. And wonder why, okay, well, well tell me, uh, what, what, other, what you doing? What, what's going on? You know, well, I, I still need this from you. Did you do the thing I needed you to do? You didn't do the thing I needed you to do. Well, I don't want to hear about your pain. We're to, in loving one another, when we see each other in pain, when we see each other suffering, that is a call to draw near, not a call to push away and come up with excuses of why I can't deal with him. He's sad too much. I can't deal with her. She's always anxious. Saints, love is sacrifice. And sacrifice means your comfort sometimes has to go out of the window. But see, they are so stuck. The Pharisees so stuck on the rule of the law. You're not supposed to do anything on a Sabbath. And this man did. Oh, let's convict him now. Mm. So here's the other said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there be a division amongst them. Mm. So they were like, well, we think he's a sinner. We don't think he's of God because he healed on the Sabbath. And the others say, well, there's no way he could heal unless he was from God, no matter if it's on the Sabbath or not, right? So there was a fraction, right? They're arguing. So first the gentleman had issues with people that knew him his whole life, told him he wasn't him. <laughs> oh, now you can see. Nah, that's not Tommy. That's not Tommy. I don't know who that is, right? So he first experienced that. And then he's brought before the Pharisees because they have a question about his healing. Right, because it was on the Sabbath. Uh, so there are some that say, no, who healed you clearly came from God. The point of his blindness. Who healed you clearly came from God. Yet those that said, can't be from God, did it on the wrong day of the week. Don't praise the Lord on the wrong day. Don't shout for joy on the wrong day. Amen. So we go down to verse 17. Then they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So, this blind beggar who happens, and for him, right, he happened to be blessed with a miracle, yet the miracle had always been planned, encountered Jesus as a stranger, and now upon further questioning, proclaims him as a prophet. His relationship with the Lord, whether he knows it or not, is growing. This man who healed him, he said, look, I, I don't think he's a sinner. I say he's a prophet. So there's even more discord. Further on, now they want to bring his parents in. And they were like, well, we want to be sure this is the right man that had been blind and begging at the gate. The same man you passed every day, now the Lord blessed him and you want to be sure it's him? Because now he can see you. He was like, I know what you sounded like before, but now I put a fix to it. Let me stop. <laughs> so they bring his parents in, right? And, and they ask them, and this is verse 19, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then now does he see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. <laughs> He's of age. He's of age. Let him speak. Let's see, what the Pharisees that were not believing didn't want were for people to believe in Christ. They didn't, they didn't want 
the individuals to see Christ as a Messiah. So they, they, they needed individuals to speak against him. Yet you have this blind man that just said he was healed by him. Well, we're going to say you were healed by Satan. I don't, I don't care what we say. But, uh, but, you know, so they have his parents. Is this your son? Because you can tell us how he got healed. Oh, hey. You see, speaking against um, Christ would have garnered favor from the Pharisees. But standing up for Christ meant excommunication. His parents didn't want to have any part. They said, you know, I ain't even going to touch it. You know, yes, that's my son. We love him. I don't, we left him at the gate at 8 a.m. <laughs> we here at noon, like you. I don't know what happened. I'm glad he could see, though, but I don't. You know, don't get to asking me questions. I can't tell you. You know, because his parents didn't want to be excommunicated. You know, I'm sure they'd heard. They were like, we didn't see it ourselves. So sometimes our closest ones to us will leave us out there on that ledge by ourselves. Say, I can't even. I can't, I, I can't, I can't. I love you. I love you. Jesus loves you too. <laughs> be over here. <laughs> so you have this young man who's standing literally by himself on his own. His own parents have said, yeah, ask him. Whatever he say, that's what it is. <laughs> we want to stay in communion with y'all. We want to stay in fellowship. So it's up to what he says is on him. Right? Because excommunication wasn't just like, okay, you can't attend this temple. It meant you can't fellowship outside of the temple. Can't do business with individuals. Look, they see you coming, they will cross the street. And there were periods of time. There was a 30-day excommunication. There was an excommunication where it was like, we'll tell you when you can come back. And then there was an in that forever one. You will never come back. Parents, again, you go ahead, baby. You go ahead and tell them. <laughs> We're going to be over here with Grandma. We love you. Go ahead. And, and so he does answer. So they called the man again, verse 24, who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 25, he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Ha! No, I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you what I know. Look, I'm not going to put anything extra on it. I don't need to add to the work of God. I could just tell you what happened. It's on you to believe it or not. I can just tell you what is. I don't have to convince you of anything. Holy Spirit will convict you. You allow yourself to believe. That's your faith. I'll just tell you what is. He said, look, I, I'm not going to get in a judgment call of this man. But I'll tell you what he did. Interestingly enough, none of those Pharisees could heal him. Hmm. They couldn't do it. Huh. They busy debating where did he get the power to do it from. You just mad because you couldn't. Stop it. I'm sorry. Oh. And so he said, um, and he continued, the, blind, the formerly blind man continued to defend Christ. Verse, let me see, um, verse 30. Actually, verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Mm. Who is Christ? The Son of God. He says, the Father and I are one. Who is Christ? I am. 34. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins 
and you teaching, you're teaching us, and they cast him out. Here, this uneducated beggar had more theological knowledge than the Pharisee. Ha! Huh. He told them about themselves. And again, not all of the Pharisees felt this way, but enough of them did. Enough to be able to excommunicate him. You're gone. And this wasn't going to be for 30 days. He was gone from his community for good. Hmm. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, mm, let's do that again. When he found him. Now that capital, he is Jesus. It wasn't the man in search of Jesus. It was Jesus in search of the man. Ah, the man who had been utterly rejected by his community, cast out by his religious leaders for a healing that he received from the Son of God. Christ went for him. Christ healed him and then found him. Mm. He said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Mm. Then he said, Lord, I believe and he worshiped him. Mm. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who may be blind, and those who see may be blind. Mm. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you see, mm. we see, therefore your sin remains. He said, you can see me. You've seen the work that I've done. You've seen the miracles that have taken place, but do you believe? He was asking the Pharisee. And isn't that interesting? All right, so the man is cast out, but he got some, some fans straggling behind. And I see, well, what's going to happen with this man now? We cast him out. Christ found him. And in talking to Jesus, he found that he is the one. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. So for this man who met Christ as a stranger, then saw him as a prophet, now calls him Savior. Ah, hallelujah. 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 When we first hear the message of of God, and we first hear the message of Christ, it is strange to our ears because he's a stranger. We don't, we don't intimately know him yet, but he knows us. And he works in our lives, and he draws us, and he calls us to him to a point that is undeniable for our souls, but to cry out, yes, I believe. Hallelujah. Mm. And then after this is when Christ went into the discussion of being a good shepherd. He says, look, not only do I know you intimately, I want to be known by you intimately. It's not just uh, form and fashion. It's not just coming to a place for a certain amount of time. It's about relationship. He says, I know your troubles. I know your pains. I have a salve for your hurting. I have a balm for your deep pain. I, I have comfort where you feel comfortless. I, and I know you. And I love you. Will you profess me? Will you follow me? When I call, will you come? When I open up a door, will you walk through it? When somebody asks you, who do you say he is? Will you say Christ is the Son of God, your Lord and Savior? Or shrug him off and say, well, I can't talk about that right now. I don't, I don't, it's not, not very, we'll talk about it later. Mm. When he opens up work for you, positions for you, and says, be my light. Don't go in your stead. Go in my stead. Be my light. Do we do it? Or do we go under our own steam and our own strength and then wonder why we're exhausted and it doesn't work out? 
our good shepherd watches over us. He, his rod and his staff, they comfort us, right? That rod is used to beat off predators, and that staff is used to catch us so we don't go falling off a cliff. Sometimes we have to go through the darkest valleys of our lives in order to get to the green pastures. But Christ is with us. If we know the Lord as our Savior and have accepted him as such, let us do the work. Let us, not the work unto salvation, we can't earn it, but the work of our relationship with the Lord. May we love one another as Christ loved us. May we work diligently for his kingdom. Mm. When he opens up an opportunity for us to share about him, let us share. Regardless if people back away, can't touch that, <laughs> you on your own. Oh, no, I'm not. For the Lord is with me. Hmm. Hallelujah. He is with us. He is with us and he has a plan and a purpose. May we walk in that purpose. May we walk in that plan. May we not be ashamed of him so that he won't be ashamed of us. But remember, whatever you're going through, whatever trial, whatever tribulation that comes, and it's not like all the time is trial. I, I, you know, I hope not. I pray not. But God is faithful. He is able. There is nothing that can come against you that isn't already conquered. Amen. Don't lose your footing. Don't run off and go wild and fall off a cliff somewhere because you're scared. Trust in the shepherd's voice because he will say, this is the way, walk in it. Spend time in your word. Spend time in fellowship. We need each other. Amen. Amen. We're in the sheepfold. We are intelligent. Amen. We can get spooked. <laughs> <laughs> be mindful we, we, we can get spooked but let us always tend to our shepherd's voice amen I pray that you received a good word today may the Lord add a blessing to his word